forests. In a province so closely tied to the sea, we sometimes forget what an important resource the forests are and how vital it is to protect them. Pulp and paper. It's a $265 million a year industry. More than 5,000 Newfoundlanders work in the woods or in one of our three paper mills. There are 1,700 sawmills in the province, producing nearly $9 million worth of lumber each year. Thousands of us take to the woods every summer, many to private cabins up in the country, more to public parks and campgrounds across the province. And the forests provide a home for an abundance of wildlife. Fire is not the only enemy of the forest, but it can be the most devastating. So when fire strikes, a small army is mobilized to fight it. And within that army is a smaller unit, whose job is perhaps the most specialized and most dangerous. Hey gentlemen, we're going to go over the emergency lowering after landing here today. That's with a complete uh, hydraulic failure. So you can tell me each step at a time there. Uh, who wants to start there first? First step is to reduce the airspeed to 90 knots. Okay. Next. It's early April, and Select in a St. Down. John's hotel room, there's down. a class in okay. session. That These men are the uh, pilots and co-pilots of the Newfoundland right water bomber fleet. Palmer Thibault, chief pilot with the provincial yeah, government, down. is giving a refresher yeah, course on the operation of the Kanza water bomber. After six months yeah. away from the planes, Okay, the pilots are being the, uh, reacquainted with the aircraft, the especially the procedures to be followed in okay, case of an emergency. Before they climb back in the cockpit, Next the step. pilots will review the entire mechanics of the Canzo and what to do if those systems Next fail. Step. For a full week, we Palmer Thibault carefully reviews the operations manual with the Canzo crews. Okay. We have uh, 14 pilots, six aircraft, uh, that's uh, a crew per airplane, plus a spare crew. Most of the guys are from Newfoundland, uh, with the exception we have one from uh, Ontario, and we had uh, one who will be coming back with us in the future from uh, BC. Okay, what's the uh, procedure for the nose gear? Well, some of the guys fly bush airplanes during the winter. They fly uh, freight across the uh, Straits of Labrador. Some guy go to uh, Northern Ontario flying uh, skid runs on 748 aircraft. How about yourself? Oh, myself, I'm now presently here year-round, but at one time I used to do a second fire season in uh, Chile in South America. So how would you find that as compared to uh, fighting fires in Newfoundland? Well, it's quite mountainous in South America. Compared to Newfoundland, it's really flat, although some of us don't think so. Week two, out of the classroom and onto the tarmac where the Canzo and more retraining are waiting. Okay, gentlemen, what we're going to be doing today is the emergency closing and opening procedure of the doors. Now, you went through the systems in school for the past four days, and you learned how the systems work, so now you're going to practice before you go flying and see how they actually do it. So what I'm going to do is take each person individually, run them through the systems, and make sure you know it. It's too late after you're up there trying to figure out how it works. So when we're finished the airplane now, you're going to know how it works. Everybody is. The first thing we want to do for using the water bomber system is turn on the isolation valve, make sure it's on. Uh -huh. We need hydraulic pressure to the system back there. So we're going to pick up a load of water first. So the isolation valve is on, the tanker master is on. Okay, we got four green lights mm -hmm. in the top there. Everything is okay. The next thing we're going to do is, well, you've landed in the water, you want to pick up a load, you lower your probe. 
-huh. Now some pilots prefer to pick up their load with the probe up first and then put it down after they hit the water. Other people like to have the probe down before they hit the water. You come off the water. As soon as you come off the water, arm your system mm -hmm. right away. Okay, oh, the system is armed, BMC. and just as you arm the system, the engine quit, the right engine. So, the first thing you want to get rid of the water. Uh -huh. You push the button, nothing happens. Now you've got an engine out, the airplane is sinking, you want to get rid of that water in a hurry. The thing you do is pull the handle, mm -hmm. dump the water, the doors come open, the water is gone. So you've got 8,000 pounds gone. Then you can leave the doors open, trim up your engine, and worry about the doors afterwards. Finally, ground training is over, and it's time to go flying. Palmer takes the pilots up one at a time. Well, we take them up for approximately two hours. We do uh, a little air work, uh, steep turns, stalls, climbing, descending. We do uh, touch and goes runway, touch and goes water, and then we get down to practicing uh, water pickups. We do uh, approximately 10 pickups with uh, each pilot, and then we send the crew off together for another two hours. So about four hours, and they're ready for the season. Canzo is a vintage Second World War aircraft. It was built in the early 1940s as a submarine chaser. One of them is on record as having destroyed two subs in one mission. The planes were modified in the late 1950s to enable them to fight forest fires. And they've been used in Newfoundland for more than 20 years. They are a special breed, a plane of remarkable durability. I, I don't know how many there are left in the world, but I know in Canada there must be at least uh, 20, 25 in Canada operating as uh, a water bomber for, for fire suppression. And we carry uh, 800 gallons of water, which we uh, drop on the fire. We use a lake uh, anywhere about a mile long. For the, for the pickup, it's just a uh, scooping technique we use. It's a normal type uh, landing on the water and then apply power and we scoop up the water through a, a probe system. And the uh, lake conditions, uh, today it's uh, a pretty smooth day. We only got about a 15, 20 knot wind. Waves on the lake are only about a foot high. We're the maximum wave for uh, scooping is supposed to be uh, two feet. But however, today, it's uh, pretty nice out there today. Skimming across Mobile Big Pond at a speed of 60 knots, the Canzo has picked up four tons of water, more than a quarter of the aircraft's weight when it's empty. Now, when you release that on a drop, what's the effect on the aircraft? Well, the aircraft, the nose will pitch up. It'll, it'll want to climb. You are so used to it that uh, you're reacting at the same time it, it's the water is released so really it's it's not a problem the pilots know this area 
They practice on this pond all the time. But what happens when there's a fire in an area they don't know? No, you fly over from about uh, 500 to 1,000 feet up, and you should be able to see any shoals or rocks beneath the surface. But a lot of times, I imagine you're, you're, you're going down almost blind, right? Eh? No, you always have a look. You never take it for granted. You always circle and uh, choose your spot. Eight thousand pounds of water dropped from heights of 50 feet or less. It packs quite a wallop. Well, if you're uh, down low enough, it will uh, break uh, about six inch diameter trees off, uproot trees. What kind of effect would it have, for instance, if you happen to drop it on a house? To cave the roof in. Matter of fact, at one time, uh, a friend of mine had a, a barn that he wanted uh, torn down out in the middle of the field. So he asked us if we would uh, drop some water on it, and we, sure enough, we did. We uh, put three loads of water on there, and there was no more barn. It was flat. It's been a nice spring afternoon for a training run. But there are other days ahead, hot summer days, when it will all be very much for real. The summer of 1984, it was a scorcher. The hot weather started early in July. Day after day, temperatures pushed into the high 20s. Day after day, not a sign of rain. Everyone headed for the outdoors. In parks and campgrounds, the topic of discussion was the weather. Newfoundland summers are not known to be this generous. A couple of hot sunny days in a row is good fortune indeed. A couple of weeks is a downright miracle. But while most of us relaxed and enjoyed the heat wave, others grew more and more concerned as each day went by. The warnings were there, and for the most part, they were heated. But the woods were a time bomb ticking away, and the seconds finally ran out. It happened in Green Bay, a few miles from the town of Burlington. Some picnickers had boiled up alongside a small brook. When they left, they thought their campfire was out. It was only a few embers, but the wind came up, and the surrounding brush was perfect kindling. In a matter of hours, that small campfire was making big news. The town of Burlington and Green Bay is being threatened by a forest fire. The fire broke out late Saturday afternoon. It has destroyed a sawmill and at one point was only a kilometer away from the town. People in Burlington are ready to evacuate if they have to. Jerry Jones has a report. Right now the fire doesn't pose a serious threat to this community of about 1,500. But that situation could change quickly if the wind direction was to shift to the north, sending the flames towards the town. That was the situation last evening. And for the people of Burlington, there were some tense moments. Some of the residents left, and preparations were made to evacuate those that stayed. During the night, the wind abated and shifted to the east. By mid this morning, most of the fire was in the ground, with an occasional flare-up. But by early afternoon, it was once again racing through standing timber. The, forestry the Burlington fire was to dominate the, the news for more than a month. Despite the work of 150 men on the ground and five water bombers, the fire refused to quit. And as long as it kept coming back, the town of Burlington was in constant danger. For Ray Melanson, it was one of the toughest fires he's fought in 20 years of flying the Canzos. We could go out early in the morning, pick up a load of water, and proceed to the fire. And uh, Actually, there wasn't any fire, just a burnt over area. It was very difficult to find a spot even to dump one load. When we arrive on the scene, let's say, early in the morning, 
there's nothing there, as though it's just a place on the ground where a fire had been. And around 11 or 12 o'clock that day, the place is an inferno again, and that there's nothing you can do with it. As hard as you try, the thing keeps coming back day after day after day. The ground crews fighting the Burlington fire set up base in a gravel pit. From there, they were dispatched by helicopter to the troublesome hotspots. It was all coordinated by a fire boss and his deputy. In a fire as unpredictable as this one, they had to know the location of every man they had in the woods. Okay, uh, Lloyd is pulling out Glenn Buck from right here now. He's, uh, when he gets him out, he's going to check on Dave Hoster's crew. There's a fair amount of smoke in this area too, Dave. No, we already took out this crew right here. Uh, we pulled them back to the road and they've laid a line down this edge right here. So we tried. When Ray arrived in his Canzo, uh, he automatically checked in with the operations base on the ground. There is a fire boss, and we take instructions from uh, either the fire boss directly or one of his assigned deputies, or in some instances, we may be given uh, the choice to combat the fire at our own discretion. This was a tough fire for many reasons. Not only did the pilots have to jockey their canzos through blinding smoke and turbulence caused by heat, but the terrain itself was a hazard. Climbing out of a drop, the canzos would be forced to turn sharply to avoid the surrounding hills. Then there were other canzos and a half dozen helicopters to watch out for. And there was the pickup area, Burlington Harbor. The biggest problem was that the wind was very seldom ever either directly in or out of the harbor. It always quartered on the harbor or was directly across the harbor. And uh, going across the harbor is really narrow. The maneuvering room is quite marginal. And it really didn't make for a, a, a safe, really safe operation. What about uh, getting up off the water and back in the air? Again, Picking up across the harbor, you had approximately 15, 16 seconds to get on and off of the water. And after you were off the water, you were picking up across the harbor, you had to uh, turn quite sharply low to the water in order to miss the hills that you were approaching on the pickup. So there are quite high hills around the harbor? Oh, yes. The hills range from sea level to a thousand feet above sea level. For more than six weeks, the pattern repeated itself. Just when the fire appeared to be contained, it came roaring back to life in a fresh stand of timber. The fire had taken a firm hold, burning deep in the ground, almost invisible, until the wind and heat whipped it into furious life again. The firefighters were forced into a holding action, try to keep it in check and work on the areas that could still threaten the town. The Kanzos could only try to hold down any flare-ups until the ground crews could get there. The fire had grown too big for the Kanzos to make much headway. The water bomber is most effective when a fire is detected in its very early stages and it's not too large and it hasn't been given a chance to get out of control 
and an air aircraft is dispatched to that fire immediately, quite often, nine times out of ten, we can knock that fire down. It was nature that finally defeated the Burlington fire. Steady, soaking rain. More than a week of it. Penetrating into the ground where the flames still smoldered. After almost two months of exhausting work, the firefighters could relax at last. Many went home. Others stayed behind to fly into what had been the worst areas and dig the fire out of the ground. Twenty-five square miles of forest were gone. The charred stumps and scorched ground hissed as the cold rain fell on them. It had been one of the worst fires in years, but it was finally out. A sawmill had been lost, but Burlington had escaped. Tireless work by the ground crews and the Kanzos, combined with some good luck, kept the fire away from the town. The stubbornness of the Burlington fire, the hilly terrain, the dangerous pickup area, were a tough challenge for the water bombers. For some of them, it may have been the last time they'll face this kind of challenge. You see, there's a new kid on the block in the water bombing business. It's called the CL-215, built by Canadair. It's big, fast, and flashy, with twice the power of the Kanzos. The new planes can pick up water in six-foot waves. The Kanzo's limit is two. The CL-215 has a capacity of 1,200 gallons of water, 400 more than the Kanzo. By 1987, four of these modern water bombers will be operating in Newfoundland. Up against this sophisticated newcomer, the Kanzos will look like the vintage old-timers that they are. But for the men who have flown them for the last 20 years, those reliable Kanzos will be hard to replace. Will you be sad to see them go with them when they're replaced by these new, more modern uh, water bombers? Oh, I don't think the new modern water bombers are going to replace them. Not while I'm here, anyway. I hope not. I hope not. Why is that? Well, because they are a kind of echo of the past, very enjoyable, and people are very taken up with them. Including yourself? Including me, yes, especially me, yeah. 